video. I'm doing my best not to make this look bad uh, as, I, as I do today. Um, so what I what I thought to do was to make a presentation that would be really special for all of us. So my my talk today exists in two parts. The first part is going to be me talking about past work, and then I'm going to be talking about uh, new work. And, and I thought one of the best ways to talk about my new play was to invite the actors to actually come here, be in the room with us. And then we would do a table read of the first few scenes of my whole play. So, doesn't that sound great? Yeah. And then Lonnie said no, now you know, uh, COVID restrictions and all. But I was able to get two of the people in the room. So uh, we're going to do that. And then uh, in combination with the rest of my cast, we'll be uh, online um, uh, on Zoom. And we'll do the best that we can to, to work with the script. So, um, methods and approaches for me is kind of a, uh, a retroactive way of looking at the uh, deep dives that I've known from different projects and then ask myself, like, what was the fundamental kind of foundational structure that helped me to take these various ideas and interests and, and merge them together? Over time, I, I began to understand that what I was really struggling with as a visual artist was a was a simple problem, which is that I was constantly trying to figure out how to represent things that couldn't be represented. Um, so, for example, like uh, take like a classic jazz album. Like, what do you think of when you think of a classic jazz album? Anybody? Something from the fifties. Anyone? Miles Davis, Memphis, Fanny Fox. Okay, yeah, very specific. But I just meant hard time to speak. <laughs> It's usually like a dark room, full of slow, really monochromatic, right? So those kinds of tropes actually flatten out the idea of what jazz is because jazz in its nature is improvisational. So in its way, it never really exists until it's there in the moment it's being co-created uh, together um, spontaneously. So uh, uh, over time, I started to, to build these, um, these models and I, I, I used them to form my work as I'm, as I'm working now proactively, but also it's the it's the models that I use when I'm critiquing all of your work when I'm sitting in your room. So if this works, um, we're going to use uh, an opaque projector and uh, go over these things. So here's the five parts of my presentation today. I'm going to talk about these three methods, decentering, dislocation, and the gutter. And then two new ones that I've kind of been extracting, they're still a little bit rough, one is called yielding, and the other one is uh, the story circle, which is related to the narrative aspect of the work. Uh, so these are the three elements here. I'm going to draw them out for you, and then I'm going to discuss them uh, with you uh, together. And let's see how I do. If I turn this this way, can you guys still make sense of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So let's imagine this first motif first method, that um, this is a wall, this is a stage, and this is the audience watching a show on stage. Okay? So on the left side of the stage, there is a uh, very distraught guy, very upset, he's uh, on the phone with his uh, um, he's very distraught because he's uh, calling his uh, his uh, wife um, on the cell phone. Okay. So on the other side of the wall that divides the stage, there is a, a bed, and there's two people in the bed. They're very happy. They're kissing each other. Those are the beats that kind of cover. Right on the edge of the bed, you also see. A cell phone plus. Okay, so the question is, as an audience member, what are you supposed to focus on? Are you being asked to focus on side A on the stage, side B, or something else? This is a school friend. The teacher asks the question, somebody wants to read something out. That's usually how it works. What, are, what, is the, what is the director of the show asking you for? Huh? Hey. Hey? Okay, somebody want to help me out? 
Well, I've never heard anybody else would have helped out. Okay. It is, I think mean, that's just hard to be easier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think he's asking us to focus on our system of religion. Yeah, I have a very loud machine here next to me. So I think what you're saying is that you're supposed to focus on both of them. So as the person in the audience, what's happening here is that the director is showing you something on the left. They're showing you something on the right. But really what you're focusing on, both of them. So in, in this regard, in uh, this, is, in this particular model, I'm going to that for that um, So in this particular model, what the actor, what the director is asking you to do is to focus on both of them. And in that way, the action is actually not in the center of the stage. The action is actually pushed off of the center to the left and the right. And it's asking you, uh, they are asking you to combine that into your mind. Right? So in your mind, if you're watching the show, the action is actually happening here in your brain, even though I'm showing you two different things. Okay, so this is the model of the center. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you these. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is just illustrate the model, and then I'm going to show you some of the And some of you might be familiar with this, particularly the other grade twos, because I, I tend to draw these. But hey, you know, sometimes you see it here. Okay. So let's imagine that we're looking at a landscape painted by, say, some Impressionistic trees, they thought most likely rolling over in this grave. Um, so let's imagine this is a landscape, okay? And say is doing a painting tree. Now, um, let's introduce a couple terms. Um, one is a uh, subject, and then the other is content. So content is, in this example, are you still out here?
So we would have multiple images um, across different settings. Right? So let me just do a, something very elementary.
parents have never been fully understood. Thank you. 
let me let me go back to this. Um, so the can you guys hear that audio by the way? You guys can hear it okay. Okay. So the project is called a, a book and a metal, and it was it was inspired by uh, a coincidence, which is that uh, the FBI had redacted what's infamously known as the uh, as the suicide letter that was sent to Martin Luther King after he was no after he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. This was sent to him in uh, 1964. Um, coincidentally, within like six months of that letter being released, Bernice King, Dr. King's daughter, uh, said that her brothers were suing her because they wanted to sell the Nobel Peace Prize and the Bible uh, that Dr. King had, uh, that he had used uh, during that time period, which he considered to be a, uh, a tool for uh, social uplift, but over that 50 year period of time, according to the brothers, they no longer saw it as a tool, but they saw it as a weapon. Right? It was no longer useful. And in that regards, uh, it could be sold and put into a cabinet and then for tourists to come by. Now, According to Bernice, which by the way, she did lose the lawsuit. She didn't want to have to give it to them. I don't know who they sold it to. Um, but as I was thinking about the movement between 64 and 2012, which by the way, is that math wrong? That's 2014, right? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure somebody in the room was like, uh, Edgar, um, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, but is that a four? Yeah, that's a four. Okay. So, um, I was thinking about this. I was like, what changed those two things? What changed it from a tool to a relic? And I realized that that thing that changed it was a force. Um, and that force was, uh, was economic. Right? Um, even though, because the, the Bible did not change in its substance, it was still exactly the same book. The metal was made of all the exact same materials. But somehow its use value had become transitioned over that 50-year period of time. So these two things look exactly the same, but according to the by, by economic force, they were transmutated into something else. So this is my uh, example of, uh, of dislocation. So I'm showing you two things. I'm showing you a letter on the left, and I'm showing you a letter on the right. But what I'm really trying to manifest is the force that transformed those two things together through those panes of the mirror, which is made out of the redactions from the original. Does that make sense? Okay. One last one, and then we'll look at some new work. So Spock, Tuvok, and Tupac is my way of manifesting that. So this is the drawing that I made back in uh, back in uh, 1997, uh, when I was first finishing my undergraduate studies at, uh, at Cal Arts. No, no, at Arts Center, I'm sorry. And um, I wanted to make a drawing that somehow was able to draw a connection between Spock and Tupac, but somehow I kept mentioning the word Tupac in my head. He just came out with Machiavelli. My brother was playing on every single day. Um, and I think within a year, he might have been dead. Uh, but every time I tried to make a drawing about Spock and Tuvok, I realized I was caught in a kind of a binary situation because it became about black and white, you know, old and new. But I was really interested more in that gap between the two. But back in 97, I didn't really know how to describe that. Right? Um, but with time, and uh, just continuing to research and make work, I, I came to understand what I was really trying to manifest was the space between the images. And over the series, I made something like 20 of these drawings. And just one thing to know, these are all based on coincidence and chance, so like I never sat down to make the drawings. They always just had to happen on their own. I'd be walking down the street, I'd look at a magazine, something would happen serendipitously, and then the drawings would be they were roughly about this size, and they're all, all the heads are about this big. I wanted to make it about, I don't know, I worked on this about three years, and then at some point the system became self-aware, and then I started dreaming about them. So anyway, I had to leave it alone uh, at a certain point. Uh, it, it, my brain got it. Okay, so uh, any questions about 
those three things that we just talked about before I move into the new world? Have I covered everything so thoroughly as to exhaust all questions? I haven't been teaching for a while, so I'm pretty good. No? Nobody wants to call bullshit or anything? All right, I'll give you a chance later. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm just opposing these two bodies of work together because I've been developing them around the same time. Uh, and if you haven't figured out at this point, what I'm, what I'm focusing on is, is underlying structure and less on the actual kind of details of the projects themselves. Which if, if you want to dig into any of this material, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it later. What I'm, what I'm trying to outline for you is sort of what I consider both personal and critical agency that help to shift and direct me towards certain subjects as opposed to other ones. And how, to a degree, my projects have not only spoken about the world, but they've taught me about how the world works. Uh, you know, what my siblings like to say is a uh, way of saying, this is my religion, this is my daily practice of understanding of the, the natural, the conceptual, slash supernatural world. Um, so, uh, I'm going to play a little video for you first. This is uh, February of this year. Uh, and I'm talking to myself, uh, my future self. 
Um, but also I have a, a, one of my best friends is a painter, he lives in Berlin. When I was first starting off on that project back in 2019, I was so insecure about what I was doing. I would just make videos and then I would WhatsApp it to him and then he would respond and give me little words of encouragement and be like, yeah, I don't know, keep going on that. So, in this, so what I've been doing is making these little video diaries as for myself. So in a year from now, two years from now, I'll remember what I was thinking about. Uh, what I did during that time period, like my little cookbook. Uh, but I also made it for you too. Um, so I want to jump back in time right now because that body of work was in 2021, but I was in a bit of a crisis back in uh, 2018. Um, I was working on this play called Boney Manili. I had no idea what it was about. I'd written at this point probably 16 different versions of the script, and I was just like, oh my god, like, what is happening? So this is one of the trailers that we made for one version of Boney. And again, later I'm gonna we're gonna read for you what I think is a far superior version that now makes sense. Um, so this gives you a little bit for those who don't know who Billy Vanilli is. The Boney Vanilli is loosely inspired by the pop duo Billy Vanilli. Tony Vanilli is a live play that draws inspiration from Billy Vanilli. The controversial pop and roll from the 90s that was scripted in grand movements. A fool! I was leaving things in the brain, I was 
burning, very expensive shoes. And that was actually Dwayne Johnson's shoe. My sister used to be his makeup artist. And she gave me shoes. I didn't like them, so I set it on fire. You know? <laughs> Thank you. 
recognizing that the paintings were changing depending upon the light they were. They were actually breathing in a way. And when the sun set, they, they shifted, they changed. Notice by now, I make a lot of videos of me doing stuff with the work. Um, part of the reason for that is because it's very difficult to capture things in a still photo that's meant to be experienced by moving past them. And so, well, what does light look like if I play with a candle? Well, Dislocation. 
I had no idea that it was going to lead me back to that school. But it's a deformation that will last forever. So these, these mirrors for me are a reflection of you, the scars, the sprains, the ripping, the memory, the way in which they get darker through oxidization over time. Uh, they are you. They are us. They're no longer the objective of you, but it is the it is all of you. All of those experiences. Because every single person in this room is a is a is a platitude. We're all made up of all the different people who came before us, all the different experiences, different casual interactions, the intimate ones, the traumas.
Okay, I'm gonna guide everyone through this. <laughs> Start with our forehead. Sonny is trying to direct a play about the 
of this pop duo, Nilly Vanilli, while struggling to take care of Mama, who slowly died from it. So he has to play a semi, there's some biographical elements to it, so if you guys might, uh, if, you, if you're thinking that. Uh, the rest of the family is on their own journey, searching for a missing story. The family legend goes that Sonny Sr. wrote the script for the Disney movie, Song of the South, but was never credited for it. The family hopes to find the script at Sue Walt Disney Studios, but Mama hid it and forgot where it is. With original music, dance numbers, and a barbecue, Moni Manili is an epic tale traversing 100 years of history, both real and surreal, confronting family trauma and learning to let go. So here's our cast. There's nine characters, they make up a family. Uh, Frank plays Sonny, uh, Mama Gifele plays Mama. Terry plays Bro Bro, the little brother. Linda is sister girl, and uh, she is the uh, wife of uh, Bro Man, who is the brother of Bro Bro, the son of Mom and Dad. There's Robin Fab from Millie Vanilli, and then there's a daughter who's playing, played by our one and only Xiao Yu. And then uh, Fab and Dad are being played by me uh, because our actor John couldn't be here. We have a few actors that couldn't be here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and take that part. Okay, let's see if we can see Alex. Okay, are you guys ready to hear the story? Yeah. Yeah? All right, let's see what time is it. Give me the time. 8.12, okay. Let's see what we can do in 10 minutes. If you guys wanna hear more, then we'll be a little bit All right, and if you want to stand up, I mean, there's nothing really to see. Hey, Alex, good to see you, man. You're looking good, yeah, bro. Good, good, good work. Yeah, we can see you and hear you. I had to go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Okay, and so everyone here can hear us fine. Frank, say something. Hello, hello, hello. Can you guys hear Frank? Hey, John, you say something. Okay, all right. So, uh, scene one, Bonnie Vanilli. Sonny is standing at the kitchen sink, played by Frank. Dad is standing nearby, leaning on the countertop. Music can be heard in the background. This muffled is coming through the wall. He's filling a pot with warm water and holding a second pot, tapping it with his finger to the beat. Festive sounds of men laughing and talking can be heard through the other walls. Sonny walks down the hall with the pot. Dad follows behind him briefly, turns toward the barbecue instead. Sonny is pouring the water from one pot into the other, making a rhythm. He's singing under his breath. Interior bedroom. Mama is in bed and Sonny is standing beside her holding two pots. One is full of water and the other holds a washcloth. Gunny can be heard outside the window. There was a barbecue happening outside. Um, and just FYI, this is written from a stage perspective, so it's a little more wordy than it would be if it was like a movie. Um, a little more descriptive. So, mom and sister-in-law are in the bedroom together. It's early afternoon, sister-in-law is sitting on the bed right next to her. Mama is laying on her back, staring at the ceiling. A sister-in-law speaks with mom. We don't hear the conversation, but it's intimate and a bit silly. Sister-in-law can be heard saying to mama as Sonny enters the room. Mama, it was you who taught me that we didn't want to start ghosts. That's right. Learned that from my daddy. I still see him once in a while. Hey, what's up, sis? Nothing, just sitting here with mom. How's she doing? She's awake, being kind of dangerous. Hey, how are you doing, there, old lady? Sunny boy, come take me with you. Mama, you still remember me? I could never forget my handsome boy. Uh, so sweet. You see the boat and the sail up there with red sun? Mama's arm is extended out and she's looking at the ceiling. Uh, I can kind of see a rabbit up there. I can for sure see the ship. It's got to be a mighty mess. I kind of see it. It looks more like a big old bear to me. <laughs> Ready to get cleaned up? She sure is. I can smell it from here. Yep. Then you're gonna take me with you? Mama looks at sister with a scowl and balls up her face and fists shaking it at Sunny. Two pots, one with clean water and the other empty for the clothes to be, for the cloth to be wrung into with soapy water. The sound of the water being wrung from the rag into 
moment of pause in the scene, the gentle ballet of washing her skin and moving her gently to avoid injuring her frail body is beautiful to watch. Don't get mad at me. I didn't say nothing. Sonny begins bathing his mother. So good at that, son. It was hard. The first time, you know. When you made a mess of yourself. Mama smiles while staring in the sunny eyes. I can hear her ass up now. You know, I was raised a good Catholic woman. My son seeing me naked, oh God, never. I'd be mortified. Couldn't live it down. Never thought it possible. But after about 70 seconds, it somehow became normal. All that Christian dogma and shame taken away by the disease. Just a beautiful thing between two people. One just a little more in need of help than the other. But you need help this son. Earl, <laughs> it's a trifecta. There's a pandemic, I'm getting a divorce. I don't know if my daughter will ever see me the same way again in my play. I can't make sense of it and I can't figure out why. My actions are dropping like flies. I mean, I understand. It's been close to three years and shit. Shit don't make sense to me anymore. Takes a pause and then looks at mom. She a different person every day. But somehow she's still herself. Seems some truth about life there. Somewhere. Her daughter walks into the doorway. Stands there looking at the floor. That's more than Hey, baby. Don't be afraid. You can come in. Your mom just dropped you off. Me? Why are you talking about me? I didn't drop nothing. Daughter walks over to Grandma, covering her face with her hand. She's looking side-eyed at sister-in-law. How to, Grandma? Love you. Yeah, she just left. Was outside talking with Grandpa and my uncle. She didn't want to come and say hi? Sad by the news. Here, help me turn her on her side so I can wash her back. Gentle now. Why are you looking at me like that, girl? Can't say hi. I don't know. Nothing to be afraid of here. Sound of scratching and rustling sounds can be heard in the attic. Daughter grabs Sonny's arm and leans in, hiding her face. I've been telling Dad to get that looked at. That ain't no rag, that's a rabbit at the bear up there. <laughs> See the rabbit up there? Sonny points at the pattern in the ceiling. Daughter pokes her head out of his arm. Looks, uh, looks and hit her face again. Um, looks like a black box in the Everyone follows the sound as it moves beyond the room. You say for grandma. Thank you, Grandma. You always made it that way. Sonny and daughter are close to finishing being mom. You were always my favorite friend. Not like your brother. If I had ever got a chance to divorce that Negro, I wouldn't marry yet. I would just have a man on the side and some I need. I ain't trying to kill myself again for another man. Grandma balls her fists up and points at her sister-in-law. You can still get in trouble with mom now. And, um, a child in the room? The daughter starts laughing. Oh, so you're gonna be my friend now, huh? I don't know. This is just all so weird. Uh, Dad, that's what you're putting on her? Look good to me. Does it look good to you, Mama? It looks very nice to me. Oh, you're done right. It looks bad, sweetheart. Daughter grabs pajamas that match. Sonny and daughter finish. Daughter wants to leave, and Sonny's got reversals. They prop her up on the pillow. I thought it was fine. Oh, God, look at the time. Mama, I gotta go. Birdman is coming in a little later to feed you. God is gonna put on my favorite channel. Your gospel is gonna fill you up. Let's pray some together, okay, Mom? Sonny, you take me with you. I don't wanna see the show. Oh, go ahead, Mama. Later, though, okay? Daughter gonna stay. Daughter shakes her head no. No? You're not staying? Uh, where are we gonna be here soon? I'm gonna go get it. Screams out the window. 
smoker uh, with a set of Okay. Man, this shit is good. You know it. Passing out from generations is a good job. Hey, give me a piece. Reese's for death, man. We'll get you some. Get off my piece. Eats and swallows. Boys, your mom is hiding stuff all over the house. I can't find a single knife. Her jewelry is gone. Says I took it. Gave it to my other woman. You got another woman in the box? Another thing? Boy, please. Hell, you can barely handle what I got. He's on that. Leave it over, please. Exactly. All my socks are gone, too. That makes no sense to me. Why do I like socks? I go looking, but all I can find is boxes of greeting cards. Mama sure did love some of those greeting cards. You got most of mine saved somewhere. Me, too. Somewhere. But you know what? As I was searching, I was thinking in the back of my mind, I wonder if I'll come across that uh, your grandpa's script that he sent to Burt Whiskey Studios. I mean, I found hundreds, thousands of greeting cards, but shit, no script. Your mother hit it and can't remember where it is. Maybe she thought I was gonna steal that too. It would look like that. Opened his phone and started searching for something. It was written by hand on a white line paper, but it's yellow right now. Shit, Sonny only had a fifth grade education, so his writing wasn't great, but boy, that man was some bastard storyteller. You know what I'm talking about? Tell him, brother. You missed out, bro. So he was from Mississippi. So he had that funny Southern draw when he told the story. His grandma was his face, and she told him all the inventions of rear rabbit, rear fox, and rear bear. The tar man was like that at first when I was a little kid. Yeah, uh, uh, he would make me feel like you were back there in those times, would not That was Sunny. So we had it tight up and sent over there to wish me. Heard nothing. Two years later, the grandpa Sonny voice was up there on the big screen. They couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. How could they go down and go do him like that? No credit, no recognition of his talent, just death. Sonny was flattered by it. He was old, just like me today. But your mom and her family, they were pissed. Back then, they wanted to sue. The black folks didn't have no power. Shit, we still don't. Now she can't remember where she hit it, neither can I. We all be doing that by now. We thought about sewing, but then y'all came along. You was young, needed a lot of attention and money. Grandpa Sonny got sick and eventually he passed. And y'all needed stuff. It's expensive rates for kids, man. Then slowly but surely, life just moved on. But now after all the black lives matter protests, me too. White folks are all black. They afraid. Now, now is the time we should sue Burn Whiskey Studios. We can win. Look this up on your device. Burn Whiskey Studios lawsuits. All right, indeed. The Burn Whiskey Studios sued the plagiarism for the frozen snow queen. Look at that movie. Let it go. Let it go. Oh, no, no, no. Look, Burn Whiskey Studios sued for plagiarism. But upside down and inside out? Sleeping Beauty is originally a thought. Ready? Oh, man, no! Don't tell me that! Wish me land is my favorite place on earth. I don't my childhood by telling me they can steal it and do it wrong for them, right? Like I tell you, it's just all one day lie. They banned a song in the South and it's Sleeping Platform, too. Say it's in Walmart to have happy singing slaves now. Can we just forget this and happen? Bird Mission Studio suit for the Lion King ripoff of the Japanese anime Kimba awarded $500 million out of court. $500 million? $500 million? Man, that's a lot of money. Yeah, 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 that's all that man back to tell the brisket is sold out. Boys, three sets of eyes are better than one. Yeah, let's go get that back. What y'all did? 
Nothing. Not a thing. Where y'all going?
within folklore or in, in cultural stories, uh, these things repeat themselves over and over again if the conditions that created them in the first place have not changed. So L-O-R-E, the lore cycle. So, you know, we don't sing a lot of songs around polio anymore or measles that were common at the turn of the century as ways of like warning children around the, the, the transmission of certain diseases because, you know, there were uh, vaccines that were created for this. Um, or you can say the motif of like blacks being as, uh, oppressed by the police. Like why does that keep occurring over and over again? Well, the reason is because the conditions that created it in the first place have not changed, or at least not sufficiently enough to bring this stuff back to the present over and over and over again. So I think it's our job as artists, at least me as a person who's interested in the complexities of representation, um, to show people that cycle, to show them the way in which it sits in the present as a kind of transient moment, but that is archetypally connected to the past. Align those windows so they can see that depth, the way in which those things present themselves. But, but what that means is that you have to be wise about your choices and you know, the things that you talk about, because not all things will present a sense of you know, that window to the past. Um, anyone else? conversation does get a little richer once the talk is over. So let me just show you. Cast, um, I appreciate you guys hanging out so much. Can you guys all say thank you?
But the, basically, for those of you who are familiar with it, the eight part circle goes you uh, need to go search for it, find it, take it, return with it, and be changed. Um, so the, the, the Joseph Campbell and the other people would use the story circle in different ways, but this one makes the most sense for me. Um, but I just wanted to recap just the things that we covered so far that, um, and uh, why I find them valuable. So both uh, decentering, dislocation, and the gutter, they uh, rely upon the intelligence of the viewer. And as a matter of fact, these strategies uh, do not work unless there is a mind of a person to participate and fill in the gaps. An artist like me, I, I think my hardest job is to figure out how to make those gaps interesting enough for people not only want to open the door and go in, but they want to stay there. They want to come back a week from now, a year from now, a decade from now. Now, they themselves are different, and then they can still enjoy it, uh, even though they're not older. Right? Just experience what we have in the um, We didn't get to yield it, um, but I'll just describe it very simply that yielding is about change. It's either a change which snaps back, or it's a change where deformation happens, and it can never come back again. Uh, those two sides of yielding uh, are the, sort of the, 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 the methodological approach that I use to make the change. The mirror never goes back to the way uh, As a metaphor, thinking about it, and this is a metaphor, but I've got a, a material Expression which runs alongside how we live. So yeah.